Welcome to the Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's podcast. I'm Thomas Hubert, news correspondent with the Irish Farmers Journal. Coming up on this week's show, I ask the IFS former Secretary General Pat Smith about his new job representing small renewable energy developers. We've seen increased throughputs in, in, in all of the categories, uh, increases and in, in stronger pricing as well. So I suppose one key message that I would take from it is that when the market is there, the price can be delivered. And some farmers take advantage of a fodder shortage in West Clare. Where some would see an opportunity to make a killing because you would see even in the area signs up outside farmyards where there is a lot of silage of bales being asked up to 50 euros a bale. And then more silage has been offered to the IFA where farmers are just looking to cover their cost, which is really good of them. But first, let's take a look back at Ireland's food and drink exports in 2017. It was another record year with dairy products leading the way. Irish Farmers Journal news correspondent Amy Ford was at the presentation of the figures this Wednesday and she asked Board B as Markets Director Podrick Brennan for more details. For the butter bubble this year prices went to massive highs over 7 or 8,000 euro per tonne. They've now dropped down a bit but uh, where is the butter bubble going? Is it going to burst anytime soon and what can we expect? Butter was a big driver of, of dairy in 2017 of exports. Um, where is it all going? Well, absolutely, it was a massive driver of exports in 2017 and that butter exports increased by nearly 60% in value to just over 850 million euros so a really big driver on the dairy side and I think really when you look at the drivers behind the increase in, in butter exports over the last year, it's it's the shift away in the marketplace from vegetable fats back more towards dairy fats. And that seems to be a health trend, if you like, that's very, very strong internationally, not just in Europe. So that has been the real driver behind it. I think given the rate of increase in butter prices during 2017, it was inevitable that we're going to tail off and come back to some extent. And we've seen that, if you like, in the last quarter of the year just gone by. Where are we heading to, for this year? I think there's probably going to be a little bit more pressure again on butter prices but you would expect given the demand that's there that global butter price will certainly remain a good bit ahead of what would have been the the average if you like over the last five or ten years so yes probably some correction we've seen happening may, may continue to some extent but certainly you would expect prices given the dynamics that are there to remain ahead of where they've been. Um, the US market then switched into beef before we got into that market a number of years ago. Former Minister of Agriculture Simon Coveney not hyped it up, but there was a lot of expectation on that market. That really hasn't come to fruition. Exports kind of haven't been where we'd want them to be, and the US is expected to remain the world's largest beef producer with more beef produced this year. We put more beef to the Philippines, which isn't really talked about, but where is the US market going? Where do you see that going? I think if you look at obviously Irish beef landed into the US for the first time in 2015, and you know, we, there was high expectations, certainly, but I think what we saw in the course of 2016 and 2017 is an awful lot of change in that market. As you say yourself, US output was up, I think, by the tune of 30%. Prices came back from nearly record highs in 2015 down by over 30% in most cases. So the market changed quite a lot uh, during 2016 and 2017. What we, what we saw, I suppose, over the year gone by uh, in particular was that for a number of months of the year, there was uh, particular issues maybe around grinding beef and getting a approval for that which slowed trade completely for a while which didn't help the situation but I think what you are noticing is and, and if you look at what the beef exporters that are active in the US are doing they're very much all, all retaining that if you like presence in the marketplace taking a long term view of where the potential is and I think there certainly is still potential in the US from maybe a niche point of view from some of the higher value cuts and obviously then we are seeing some grinding meat going as well. I think at this stage you would say it's, it's going to be a gradual build rather than any overnight dramatic increase and maybe for a longer term point of view that gradual build would leave us in a better position uh, in, in that market I think the fact that you mentioned the likes of Philippines and, and maybe other markets in Asia as well starting to emerge as strongly for Irish beef I think that's really positive development because particularly in terms of the cuts that those markets take they're a really valuable outlet for delivering value for the animal overall if you like and I think that's what we need as an industry and I think certainly uh, just being back from, from Japan and Korea and, and other parts of Asia towards the end of the year on the, on the last ministerial trade mission you certainly get a sense that there's opportunities in that region for Ireland the challenge for us is Board B and, and the industry I suppose themselves is to try and figure out how we can get a better understanding of how those markets operate where we can compete, where we can't compete and I think that sort of opportunity certainly exists to grow the volume of beef that goes into that part of the world and, and, and if and when China comes on board as well that will be another option for us but I think 
what has always helped the beef industry is having the more options we have available to us in terms of markets, the better. And I think every additional market has to be a help in terms of the average price that farmers get paid on a weekly basis. So how does the industry see this performance and what do they expect for the coming year? Board Bia held a separate meat marketing seminar on Friday, and Irish Farmers Journal market specialist Feli O'Neill puts the question to Cormac Healy of Meat Industry Ireland, the body representing factories. Yeah, I think overall uh, we could describe 2017 as having delivered a, a strong performance for the beef, uh, the beef and livestock sector uh, in in Ireland. I mean we. We've seen increased throughputs in, in, in all of the categories, uh, increases and, and stronger pricing as well. So I suppose one key message that I would take from it is that when the market is there, the price can be delivered. It's not, I mean, price is not uh, just determined by throughput. As we came into 2017, I think, Phelan, there was a lot of concern, uh, particularly on the beef side, about additional cattle kill. Uh, I think 2017 has shown and the performance has shown that we've been able to manage that additional throughput. If you look across the categories, we've seen 100,000 extra cattle, uh, 50 or so, uh, 50,000 extra pigs, 280,000 extra sheep processed this year, and still a strong performance on price. What do you put that down to in the context? Is it w- the fact that the Irish meat factories have done particularly well this year in getting out to sell the product and find the markets for it? Uh, well, I, I think it, it didn't just happen this year. I think we have strong routes to market. We have been working on those over the last decade, and huge progress has been made, both in the UK, in, in continental Europe, and also in international markets. That has been worked on. It didn't just happen last year. Uh, but I, I suppose the point I come back to is when there then is demand in the marketplace, and there certainly appeared to be good demand in the marketplace last year, then uh, we, we reap the, 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 the benefits of that work that's been done. Will the performance be sustained throughout 2018? Well, based on the figures inside uh, that we, we heard this morning, I mean, we're looking at similar uh, or, or slightly higher throughput levels. So again, we're back to the market, and will the market be able to sustain that? The one thing I would like to see happening in, in 2018 is actual real delivery now on some of the market access work internationally that's been going on. There has been a lot of effort, a lot of resource put into market access, but actually, we need to see some delivery now, some markets, you know, opening. China being top of the I was going to say, is China list. the one that you have particularly in mind there? China is certainly top of the list, and we hope to see progress in that early in the year. Uh, for pig meat, we'd like to see progress on Mexico. For sheep meat, uh, maybe some real progress on, on the U.S. So there's, there's a number of markets depending on the, the meat category. And then I suppose the other thing that's worth noting, I think, and we noticed the extra numbers again in 2018 over and above 2017, uh, there has been a drop-off in beef breeds in terms of the calves that are on the ground. There's been a growth in dairy cattle and dairy herd, but there does seem to be coming at somewhat to the, at the cost or the expense of the beef herd. Well, I, I think, I mean, we've, we've, we've heard, uh, you know, the demise of the beef herd being talked about for the last decade through various uh, phases after cap reforms, etc. Uh, but it has, it has stayed there, it has sustained. It is and remains extremely important to the overall beef sector. The suckler herd, the specialist beef herd, is important. I think only through delivery on markets and pricing, you know, from our perspective, from a processing perspective, can we help to deliver on that through the pricing system, through QPS. We have to do our bit. We also want to see more support going in behind the suckler herd from a, from a cap or a market support perspective. So, final thoughts then, Cormac. Are you optimistic about 2018? I think we're reasonably optimistic. I think a lot of a lot of good work has been done in terms of marketing. Uh, as we've always said, it depends on what's happening out there in the market. But overall trends uh, and uh, that we've heard this morning seem to be reasonably optimistic. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmers Journal podcast. Find out more at farmersjournal.ie. Pat Smith was the Secretary-General of the IFA until he left the organisation amid the pay scandal of November 2015. He now has his own business supplying renewable energy equipment, and he recently became the co-chairman of a new organisation, the Micro-Renewable Energy Federation. While he does not comment on his relationship with the IFA because of ongoing legal action, Smith told me about his new role in an exclusive interview. 
Thomas, um, the ambition of MREF is to be a voice for the micro-renewable energy um, industry right across the country and for the thousands of homes, businesses and farmers uh, who have an interest in generating some, of their, some or all of their own energy, uh, both for consumption on site and for export to the grid using rooftop solar in the main and battery storage. We've, uh, we've a lot happening in this area at the moment in terms of uh, the government putting out consultations and promising uh, government supports, but not so much for the small farm-scale project we're talking about here. Uh, what do you want to do in this area? How can you influence this? Well, we very much uh, welcome the uh, announcement by the IFA that they're suggesting that 20% of the PSO levy, and that's the existing PSO levy, um, would be directed towards microgeneration. It's very much in line with MREF's policy and it is the way forward. Uh, I believe that the uh, homes, businesses and farmers across the country can play a very significant role in helping the government meet its climate change targets going forward. But the government have to support the sector, have to encourage uh, uh, farmers and businesses uh, to adopt these technologies and they have to get them down to a level that where a farmer or a businessman or a home can say, well look at, I invest in this and I have a payback in four to five years. Uh, anything more than that um, I believe is an inhibitor and I believe with 100 million euros a year of an investment that 250 megawatts, which is very substantial, could be built out uh, without any trouble right across the country and could Communities and the people within communities uh, will do that, but they need the support from the government, and I believe that they should get it now. You've just mentioned the IFA, and uh, you, I have to play, place you here. You, you famously left the organisation two years ago, but you're still working with farmers. Uh, what can a farmer concretely do uh, in this space? We're talking about 250 megawatts, but on my farm, what does that mean? What can I do? What kind of technology can I use to take part in this kind of uh, energy revolution? Yeah, where I think that the uh, solar and battery storage are going to dominate the renewable energy space at a micro level. And it's not to knock the uh, micro wind turbines, um, but uh, with solar and battery storage, uh, uh, the very predictable, the output, uh, the technology is very dependable, and there's no moving parts, so the maintenance element of it is very low. Uh, the other thing is farmers have uh, ample roof space, uh, to, uh, uh, which is used for uh, nothing other than basically, I suppose, uh, a bit of coverage at this point in time. Um, um, so that's not a problem. And I think the ambition for farmers should be to size systems so that all of the energy that they generate is consumed on site. Now, if you take a poultry farm or, or, or a, a, a piggery, it's very easy to do that because their uh, level of consumption of energy is very constant during the day. Um, but for a dairy farmer, uh, you have a peak of energy consumption in the morning for milking and cooling and the same in the evening. And I think that the ideal solution for dairy farms going forward is going to be a combination of solar uh, generation plus battery storage. And I believe the ba that battery storage, if correctly sized, can actually act as a UPS, an uninterrupted power supply, in case of outage. So um, if the government come forward and support the, the farming and business uh, community and homes, I think they'll respond. I think there'll be an economic uh, dividend for the farming community. But I also believe that there should be uh, an environmental dividend and that all of the work that both the agribusiness sector and that the farming community do in this space, that they should get credit for it against the carbon emissions from the increasing dairy herd. And you can read the full interview with Pat Smith in this week's Irish Farmers Journal. The Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast. The common agricultural policy makes up a large proportion of the average EU farmer's income. It's due to undergo some changes at the hands of EU Agriculture Commissioner Phil Hogan. Felim O'Neill visited a farm with Commissioner Hogan in Holland and asked Mark Callan, the president of LTO, the main Dutch farming organization, how his country would respond to the commissioner's proposed changes. I think uh, we were very proud that Phil Hogan was here today and his view on the future common agricultural policy we fully support. He sees the new uh, things that society wants from us to do as a farmer's organization and farmers. 
Uh, the only problem he has is the budget. So we have to help him to uh, to obtain adequate budget for the common agricultural policy. It's very important. Um, and the second uh, big task is a soft Brexit. Okay. I, I suppose the soft Brexit bit is something that is well beyond his brief. But in terms of persuading the governments of the EU27 to invest further in the EU budget, do you feel the Dutch government will be on board for that? Can you persuade them to deliver more? Yeah, this government in, in the past times did uh, less too little uh, on that but when we keep in mind that for food security we Dutch uh, people on average pay uh, 30 euro cents per day and uh, compared to health care they pay 12 euro 30 per day and what you see is that uh, it is very uh, underestimated what we pay for food security uh, the only thing that's done on a European level is food security, and that's why you see such a big amount of money. But all the other things are done in the member states. So we have to push the uh, Dutch government more forward, to be a bit more assert- assertive, more aggressive on the budget side. On, uh, in the wider aspects of the proposed reforms for CAP 2020, he talks about evolution rather than revolution. Uh, the bits around innovation and use of technology is something I expect will find favour with your members very yeah. quickly. You are among the most innovative farmers in Europe. Yeah, we are doing well. We are the first uh, exporters within the European, second in the world. Innovation is uh, implemented very fast and, and soon here in the Netherlands. And I think Phil Hogan has an open mind and a broad scope and he sees what society wants in the future for farmers and we want to fully support him with his review of the CAF. Finally, uh, Mr President, we're at the start of a new year now. What are the main challenges and fears uh, that Dutch farmers face going into 2018? The biggest one is the new uh, CAP. Uh, We want no uh, renationalisation, but uh, adapted uh, to member states how to fill in the greening uh, measurement. Second one is the Brexit. We are a big exporter to the United Kingdom, so we want a soft uh, Brexit that is very important. That are the two biggest uh, challenges next year. Uh, the Netherlands and the UK would have been seen as traditional allies within the EU. Yeah. What uh, influences do you feel the Netherlands can have with the UK to persuade them to, if you like, remain close to the European family as part of the single market, as part of the customs union? Uh, for instance, in two ways. We were, as a Dutch farmers organisation last year, we were three days in London with the National Farmers uh, Union in, uh, in the UK to talk with them, how can we influence on both sides, our members, our our governments, to plea for a soft uh, Brexit. And here in the Netherlands, we talk with our government and with the entrepreneur organizations also to plea for a soft Brexit. So we work on both sides. President Callum, thank you very much. You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast. The fodder shortage in parts of the west and northwest of Ireland is a growing issue with a second Fodder Action Group meeting scheduled by the Minister for Agriculture next week. Our correspondent, Hannah Quinn Mulligan, visited a farmer in West Clare to find out what the fodder situation was like in his area. I'm Pat Deneau. I'm farming in North Clare, just outside Ennis Diamond, and we run a spring calving dairy herd. It's varying from farm to farm, but compared to other years where an individual might be tight on silage this year, Everybody's tight, so in the past, if a neighbour was tight, you'd get silage locally enough from neighbours, but everybody knows they're a bit short. And there's a lot of concerns, I suppose, across the, all over the west of Ireland about fodder. I mean, what's it like in the area at the minute here for farmers? At present now, early January, constantly we're seeing lorries and low loaders drawing tr- bales from farther and farther afield because um, there's nothing or very, very little to be sourced locally, so... Um, by right, you shouldn't be seeing these lorries and this happening until late March or, or April, if, if at all, in a good year. But um, this year, that's, that's one of the omens there that um, fodder is, is very scarce, uh, is that um, you, you can see these lorries on the road all the time now. And we're here in your shed. People could probably hear the cows munching there in the background. I mean, what's your own situation like? How many cows have you got here on the farm? Yeah, I carry about 50 cows and I carry my replacement calves and heifers in as well. This year, the, the second crop of silage, it just wasn't possible. I made a few attempts to get it, but kept going, hoping that a window would open up and kind of either didn't even get to cut it or got it cut and had to just leave it there afterwards. It just was not possible to pick it up after it. But Matt Aaron were even saying, and looking at the rainfall reports, I mean, rainfall was higher in the west of Ireland than it was in previous years as well. Did you find that in this area, and has did that rainfall kind of affect a lot of farmers, would you say? 
Yeah, I definitely concur with, with Mitt Aaron because talking to people that I would know even in the Midlands, which isn't very far as the crow flies, but they would be enjoying good enough days where uh, here it was just one, one flood after another kind of, yeah. And what about farmers individually then? Has it affected their livelihoods, would you say? It has put big cost on them and big mental strain on them as well because uh, this, this father just, just doesn't seem to be theirs. It definitely varies from, from farmyard to farmyard, but there, there is definitely big fin- financial pressure there uh, on, on a lot of farms, yeah. And it's a sensitive issue. I mean, you mentioned kind of mental pressure there and farmers are very private people. And, you know, sometimes there's not a lot of communication between farmers and they can feel like they failed, which is a horrible feeling. And they're keeping that to themselves. Are you, would you be worried, say, about some farmers and the mental strain? Definitely. On, on the other side of that, uh, farmers are good, good enough to look out for each other. And it's up to neighbours to um, kind of spot where people are in trouble. And the IFA as an organisation have been doing a lot. We've already played a huge role in the last fodder crisis. And we, we got a lot of fodder here into North Clare, uh, which was really, really appreciated. Already one load came in there just Christmas week uh, here into Innes Diamond. And it, it, was, it came from Tipperary. It was farmers that actually donated it for, for free. And all, all that the farmers had to pay for was the transport of it in, which on a year where father is so scarce, an awful lot of kudos has to go to these farmers to where some would see an opportunity to, to, make, to make a killing because you would see even in the area uh, signs up outside farmyards where there is a lot of silage of bales being asked up to 50 euros a bale. And then more silage has been offered to the IFA where farmers are just looking to cover their cost, which, again, is really good, good of them. And um, th- the problem now in the west of the country... On any year trying to bring in, whether it's straw or hay or anything, is the cost of transport. Like, uh, you could easily add 10 or 15 euros to, to a bale just to get it in. So, it, seeing as this fodder, it looks like at this stage, is available, we feel it's important to try and get it coming in because every bale that's brought in now is a bale that's left in a, in, in a neighbour's farmyard, maybe. And the more that's brought in now, the, the better chance we have of lessening a calamity which could turn up if, if, if the winter is delayed. An awful lot now is, is riding on when spring comes and can ground dry out and uh, how much fine weather will be needed to, to dry out ground because at present ground is in savage condition uh, listening even to very elderly farmers that have been on, on the land their whole life they have never seen ground conditions as bad as they are at present yet. There's been a lot of talk about a fodder scheme I mean would you like to see something to help with transport costs would you like to see a stretcher not come in I mean if there was a fodder scheme what would you like to see it look like? best thing that could help is seeing as fodder is being offered and there seems to be enough in certain parts of the country uh, I, I think what would be most efficient in helping farmers on the ground would be a help to um, bringing down the transport cost as seen as there is farmers good enough to um, offer silage at, at covering cost if, if, if you could get enough of a subsidy to um, help bring down the transport costs I, I think that's what would be most effective but all of those things, like uh, if the government did want to go with um, a support scheme for, for meal, that would definitely help as well. But I, I think at this stage, what would be most effective would be um, support on, on, the, on the transport. Stay tuned, because coming up, we'll have a discussion about the definition of an active farmers and some insights into what to expect from the land report on property prices this year. Exodus of farmers from the West. For more in this week's Farmer's Journal, here's Paul Mooney. Shock at 40% decline in farmer numbers in the West of Ireland. Opportunistic farmers selling silage for 50 euros a bale as fodder crisis worsens. In-depth analysis of Ireland's record 12.6 billion euro food and drink exports. And we start a seven-week series on what is the best tractor for your farm. Plus, don't miss our extensive guide on claiming tax back. Inside this week's Irish Farmer's Journal, on sale today. Now, the CAP conversation continues around the question, what defines an active farmer? It's likely to come up in the next CAP reform and define what payments are made to farmers and who should get them. Our beef specialist, Adam Woods, attended a farmer meeting in Carndona, County Donegal, and asked the Fianna Fáil spokesperson for agriculture and Donegal native, Charlie McConnellogue, for his opinion on the big issues facing farming. 
Obviously, this is an area where suckling beef is the biggest enterprise and sheep as well. One of the big topics for discussion tonight was the lack of profitability in the suckler sector, suckler beef sector, and the dropping numbers and the need for something uh, additional supports to be put in place to underpin that. Over the next two or three years, listen, the big ticket item is going to be the next cap reform and trying to ensure that the budget is in place uh, and maintained. Uh, and that's a challenge because of the Brexit issue and also because of other pressures uh, from other angles within Europe. But when when you look at the suckler beef issue, the net the, the net payment is what's le- what is direct payments. So it's absolutely crucial to maintain that. But I also believe, and Fianna Fáil's position is that we also need to see additional supports going towards the suckler cow. And our policy is to is to work towards getting a 200 euro per per cow uh, payment in the, in the medium term um, under the beef data Geno- genomics program to try and put underspend in the uh, uh, rural development program um, towards that. Um, we think that's critical because. I mean, you know, uh, in many parts of the country, uh, suckler beef and and sheep is where it's at. And um, we need to ensure that the production is there, but we also need to make sure that farmers are making an income from it. 200 a cow is a huge cost. In terms of funding that model, where do you see in terms of that money coming from? Well, I I think the government have underspent so far in the rural development programme. So uh, our policy would be to actually put a significant proportion of that underspend towards an increased beef genomics programme payment, starting off with 200 euro for the first uh, the first 20 cows under the current scheme and then listen the next cap program is coming up I think we need to look at what scheme is put in place there and we also have to look at the the option of coupling again I think under the next cap program uh, to try and maintain the sucker here because it is the core element of our of our, our of our beef product it's what we marketed that is what's what um, the consumer wants but at the end of the day there has to be a return for farmers in terms of some concerns here tonight about definition about active farmers we heard a number of farmers uh, asking the question there tonight about, I suppose, what that's going to be going forward. Have you any information to shed on that in terms of where you see that going or is it is it something to be worried about? I think the concern expressed tonight was the what was mooted previously in relation to the part-time farmer not getting fair treatment in relation to the future CAP programme. I think that can, cannot be allowed to be the case. I think the communique from the Commissioner and Commissioner, the Commissioner Hogan, um, published before Christmas, does outline that the the definition of an active farmer will be something that the member each member state will be able to have, be able to define themselves so um, I certainly mean part-time farming is a, is a big, big part now of, um, of our agricultural sector. Um, many, many of them are very efficient, effective, productive farmers and they need to be, they need to be supported. Um, and I think what we need to see under the next cap overall and as well is actually funding being targeted towards those who are actually trying to uh, be productive on their farm regardless of what size it is um, and uh, being rewarded for making the most of their resource and of their land. You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast. The first Ulster Farmers Union roadshow has just taken place in Enniskillen, and the theme of the event was farming and the environment. One of the speakers was the chief executive of Ulster Wildlife, Jennifer Fullerton, who gave our correspondent Peter McCann some background on the organisation and her view on where agriculture in Northern Ireland was going. We're a local charity that works alongside landowners and other people that are interested in wildlife to protect and care for the environment. Um, We have about 13,000 members across Northern Ireland from all parts of Northern Ireland. Um, So Jennifer, like... You're also like a lobby organisation and I suppose now it's just essentially, is it, I suppose you could call it a blank sheet for agricultural policy with Brexit. Um, what are the main points you'll be taking to, to government in the UK or, or at any point in the future if an executive gets going in Stormont or whatever? What are the things you're looking for in agricultural policy and, and farmland in Northern Ireland? Farmer is a very important role in caring for the environment. They obviously manage the majority of Northern Ireland's land and they can deliver multiple benefits for society. It's more than just food. They can also deliver outcomes uh, for the environment and the wildlife that live in the areas. A lot of stuff Michael Grove has been talking about has been public goods, so you give um, a fairly good definition of what a public good is in a, in a government policy. So what is a public good that the people on death are talking about? It's something that benefits everyone in society um, rather than just an individual farm. So, for example... Soil quality, air quality, pollinators, wildlife, wildflower meadows, there's a whole range of stuff that a farmer can add value to their local surroundings and to the public as a whole. So then uh, some people have said is food production a public good is like, you know, efficient, sustainable food production 
providing for, for, for the population, which is not self-sufficient in food anyway in the UK. Is that a public good? Sustainable farming and food production is obviously, yes, a public good. That's part of the equation and an important part and a fundamental part of a farmer's role. But again, it's how you add value to that role because you, you do so much more than just produce food. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmers Journal podcast. Find out more at farmersjournal.ie. Finally, our correspondent Hannah Quinn Mulligan spoke with Irish Country Living's property specialist Anthony Jordan about what can be expected in the next land report. Um, look, dairy farmers really were, were kind of really excel this year all around the country. I mean, dairy is going from strength to strength at the moment. You've got kind of higher uh, production. You've got better prices. So, I mean, kind of land is, uh, they are really swamping up land wherever they can get it. Obviously, the dairy drive and expansion at the moment means that there is uh, there is an appetite out there among dairy farmers for land and they're willing to pay for that land. So, um, in terms of kind of what farmers are buying land, dairy farmers are well out ahead at the moment. And is that specific to counties, say, would it be busier in the south of the country? Well, I suppose wherever dairy farmers are kind of more prevalent, you're going to get more, you're going to kind of, uh, there's going to be a better, more stronger appetite for land. Having said that, however, I mean, if you go west, while there mightn't be as many dairy farmers, forestry is obviously, um, is kind of a major kind of, is competitive at the moment. People are, are buying forest or land for forest. Is that companies buying land or is it people buying land? No, there are people buying land, but companies are obviously, there are Scandinavian companies who are active. From talking with auctioneers, there are companies that are coming into the west of Ireland and buying land to plant it. But there are certainly farmers in in the west who see it more profitable to plant land. And that's certainly reflective in some of the prices. Prices are rising in the west simply because people are forestry, people are buying land for forestry so if it's they're not buying land for forestry they're certainly the highest underbidders in those kind of auctions or private treaty sales and kind of price per acre then people will be interested and be assuming that the price of land in the south of the country is dearer would that be right that would be right now i can't give specifics on this year alone because we haven't completed the land report which will actually be out in march but we would be expecting maybe from early from early indications prices are steady but and maybe rising i don't i can't see how they would decrease this year seen as the dairy drive has or the appetite for land and demand has risen. It will be interesting to see around the country how, how land prices have held up um, in places where kind of dairy isn't prevalent. It will be interesting to see in kind of the, the tillage strongholds. Tillage had a bad year, so it'll be interesting to see how land has gone there. And a final question, do you have any predictions then for 2018? Well, in terms of, I suppose, the, the amount of land kind of supplied to the market now is going to decrease. And the reason for that is because um, long-term leasing is definitely taking hold. I suppose if you're a young farmer in the west of Ireland and you, you can't get credit from a bank, leasing is going to be your, your best option. So long-term leasing, that land is going to be taken out of the market. If you're going down south, because dairy farmers are have a strong appetite for land, that lease or the, there is going to be a lot more land being leased there too. So there is going to be maybe less supply in 2018. Um, I think from talking with auctioneers so far, there is definitely a, there is optimism, but it's cautious optimism. I think everybody is cautious of how milk prices will go this year, but I think the price of land and certainly the price of leasing will be dictated by the milk price in 2018. That's it from this week's podcast. Remember, you can keep up to date with all the farm news with our Facebook, Twitter and Snapchat profiles. You can also use our app and read the latest stories. Thanks for listening. The sound engineer this week was Ferdi Mooney and I'm Thomas Hubert. Talk to you next week. The Irish Farmers Journal podcast, online at farmersjournal.ie and on iTunes every Thursday.